grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our reflection today is based on Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 13 and following. About a year and a half ago, the island nation of Haiti was hit with a devastating earthquake. A lot of property was destroyed and many lives were lost. On the one year anniversary, the Prime Minister of Haiti announced that they reckoned that there were 316,000 people killed in that terrible tragedy. Last March, another earthquake occurred, this time in a different part of the globe, in Japan. And as you know, that quake caused a tsunami which flooded much of the country, and again, many lives were lost. But as I was reading up on uh, these two events, even though the magnitude of the earthquake in Japan was much larger and compounded uh, then by the flood, did you know there were many fewer casualties in Japan? Now why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons that uh, you have to factor in where the epicenter of the quake was and the population density and so on. But one of the reasons um, that uh, the casualty rates were so varied is because the buildings in Japan were by and large better designed to withstand an earthquake and were made with higher quality materials. Now I'm no engineer but uh, I did read one statement that makes a lot of sense to me. It said that no matter how strong or beautiful your structure is, if the foundation is weak you're going to be in trouble. Today's gospel lesson uh, has many themes, but one, the one I want to focus on is that if you have a strong foundation for our church, we'll be fine. Because as you know, no matter how strong your structure is, or no matter how beautiful, if the foundation is weak, we're going to be in trouble. It seems that every 15 minutes or so, a new movie comes out where uh, there are two people that uh, want to trade lives or um, trade bodies or something like that. And it goes along with the old saying, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. In a recent survey of young adults, Americans ages 80, uh, 18 to 29, 81% said that getting rich is their ultimate goal in life. And 51% said their ultimate goal is to become famous, to be rich, or famous and famous. Once upon a time, in order to become famous, you had to do something important. You had to accomplish uh, some great thing. It might be something good or even something bad. Bonnie and Clyde were just as famous in their time for robbing banks as anyone else. But most of the time, fame was achievement oriented. Of course, the other way it's always been true to become famous is if you didn't achieve something special was to be related to someone who achieved something special. But nowadays, it has changed. With reality television and YouTube, almost anyone can become a celebrity, even if they have no talent and really achieve nothing whatsoever. But fame is not the yellow brick road to happiness. In fact, celebrity, I found this statistic very, very um, enlightening. I, I assume it's true, but uh, it's enlightening. Uh, celebrity performers, movie stars, and other famous people are four times more likely to commit suicide than the average American. But what about riches? Who of us has not fantasized about winning the lottery or going on, uh, you know, that antiques roadshow program and finding out that that ugly uh, cast iron frog shaped doorstop in your basement is actually worth a million dollars? Being rich does solve some problems, but it creates other problems. One international survey showed that, you know who the happiest, what, which nation has the happiest inhabitants, the happiest people in the world, the most contented people in the world? It's not what you think, I'm sure it would be Nigeria. The United States ranked 16th. And uh, did I mention that the average yearly salary in Nigeria is $300? $300. Riches are not the answer. A few years ago, there was a man in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania who won $16 million in the Pennsylvania lottery. 
And he literally went, literally went from rags to riches overnight because he'd been kind of a hobo of sorts before. Now that sudden wealth, as you would expect, brought out all the vultures, people trying to take advantage of his good fortune and get, uh, get in on his, uh, on his windfall. And one person even hired a hitman to kill him, and that person was his own brother. So clearly, money does not equal happiness. What is the basis for your life? What is the foundation for your life as an individual, as a family, as a congregation? Everyone is looking for the key, that new diet to drop those extra pounds, that uh, uh, new, uh, new self-help book. Real life, my friends, comes from being in relationship with God, reconciled to Him through Jesus Christ. Even if you have wealth, even if you have fame, even if your structure is strong and beautiful, if your foundation is weak, you're going to be in trouble. Well, on our gospel lesson, apparently there was some confusion about Jesus' identity. He was going around, he was teaching and preaching, uh, he was performing miracles. Some people considered him to be a great prophet. Others mistook him for an important figure from Israel's past. But Peter, by revelation from God, confessed Jesus' true identity. He said very simply, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, he praised Peter, sort of patted him on the back and said, on that, I'm going to build my church, on that bold confession of faith. The strong foundation of any congregation is not in the uh, quality of, uh, of its programming or uh, the charisma of its people or the, even the majesty of the stained glass windows. The strong foundation for our congregation must always be to be based firmly on Jesus Christ, His life, His death and resurrection for us, His teachings, who He is and what He did for us. Everything must be about Jesus Christ. We are, by God's grace, a Christ-centered congregation. A congregation like ours could have marvelous programs, all the money in the world, and a beautiful building to impress and attract uh, people for, uh, from around the world. But without that solid footing, we'd be in trouble as a church. Now this is a very important passage, Matthew chapter 16, for understanding what the church is. Many people today, I, I found, and you've probably heard this too, like to call themselves spiritual but not religious. I think I know, you know, what is meant. They prefer to say that, uh, you know, they, they, you know, maybe they believe in God, they like Jesus perhaps, but um, organized religion is not so much for them. When you boil that down, what many people actually mean by that is while they may have some kind of personal belief system and they believe that spiritual realities truly exist, however, they don't want to have anything to do with what is called organized religion, and that usually means the church. Now again, it's, uh, the, you know, I can kind of understand uh, where some people are coming from with that. Uh, you know, the church is certainly more than an institution. We must think of it in more uh, bigger terms, but I wonder what Jesus thinks uh, when people say that. Because right here in Matthew 16, Jesus very clearly says that he will build his church. A church is not the gospel, the church is not the be all and end all, but uh, the church is not irrelevant to our spiritual lives. Jesus said he would build his church. It's his church. And he said he would build it on that profession of faith that Peter gave of him as the Savior. But here's, here's a very interesting point. Like I said, there's a lot of nuances, a lot of way, directions that I thought about going with this sermon. but. Um, I want to kind of wrap it up with uh, this line that Jesus gives. And I wonder how much you've thought about this sentence. He said, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now that, that is, uh, have you thought about what that means? That, that part about the gates of hell not prevailing against the church. That I think is a very dramatic thing to say. Uh, is battle imagery. 
Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time is Braveheart. And there's this great scene where the, the armies are sieging the cities. And to get into the city, to get into that walled fortress, they have to batter with, with a, what's called a battering ram, I assume, through the, through the door, through the drawbridge. I think a lot of the time, whenever we think about the church uh, in this world, we sometimes think that the church is just kind of like a sanctuary. We even use that word, sanctuary. In other words, it's a safe place. Uh, a place where we can come and uh, not be afraid, where we can huddle down, uh, and be defended. The arrows of, uh, and the onslaughts of the, uh, of the evil, nasty world will come, but the walls of our fortress of God's house will shield you from getting hit. And in a sense, it's true that the church, God's people, God's kingdom is a fortress. And, and I don't want you to um, not get comfort from that imagery. There are very much times when we need to huddle down and be protected and defended. But no army ever wins a war if they always remain on the defense. The only way to win is to go on the offense. And in ancient times, when you go on offense,